pardon the interruption, but I'm Pablo Torre. And Tony, NASA just brought back a sample from an asteroid. I'm Tony Kornheiser. That's okay. Just no samples from Uranus. None. None. Ugh. It's an honor. So this is this part it, is an honor. Yeah. So if Wilbon were here, see, we can't do Uranus jokes when Wilbon's here. Because he goes, ah, ha, 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 and it just kills the joke. But these jokes no, are I all funny. It. I want it. No, they're all My funny. My parents are doctors, and I do this professionally. I do Uranus yeah. jokes with you. This is the American dream. That's why they came yeah. to this country. That's my perspective they, on it. They should never have named you Pablo. They should have named you Henny for Henny Young. <laughs> That's his kind of oh. joke. Welcome to PTI, mm. boys and girls. He would have been 200 years old if he was alive today. Wilbon bailed <laughs> on you today. So I'm joined by our great friend, the host of the Pablo Torre Found Finds Out podcast, Mr. Pablo Torre. That's right. You didn't pay Take enough that. people to clap. And we begin no, today not nearly. with tonight's Thursday night football game between division foes Detroit and Green Bay, both 2-1. and one. The game is at Lambeau, where the last time these teams met, the Lions knocked the Packers and Aaron Rodgers out of the playoffs. Pablo, what's at stake tonight? Uh, it feels like actual respect, Tony. Like, this division, let's be clear about the NFC North. The Bears are trash, right? The Vikings are trash. Here are two teams we think might actually be good. And I want to zero in here on Jordan Love, because Jordan Love's having one of those seasons that makes you feel a lot better about the bitter divorce you just had. And again, the Aaron Rodgers injury even aside, what Jordan Love is right now, top five in QBR, a guy whose arm downfield is legit, like, to me, what Jordan Love is doing, what he might do against the Lions team that has been very good, two really good wins, right? Beating the Falcons, beating the Chiefs. If yeah. Jordan Love yeah. wins this game, Tony, I'm feeling so much better about my existence as a Packer fan. It's that significant to me. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think, I think we have similar feelings. I mean, it is easy to say this is only the fourth game and each team will have 13 more games down the road, and so it means nothing. Wilbon would sit in your seat, and he would say, it means absolutely nothing. But I am not Wilbon. <laughs> I believe, and it may sound like a stretch, that this is a struggle for the soul of the division. Because mm. not just this year, maybe years to come. Because, yes, the Bears stink. And, yes, the Vikings have no life right now. And I think it puts a lot of pressure on Jordan Love. If Jordan Love were to win this game, you would say, okay, I see the line, I see Favre, I see Rodgers, I see Love. He stands at the gate and he says no to Detroit. But if Detroit were to win this game, it turns this division upside down. If Detroit yep. wins this game, I believe it would be the fourth straight time that they would beat the Packers. And so they could say they own the Packers. It would be the first time since 2016 that even as early in the season as game four, they were in first place in that division. And it would mean that we would have to take that team and Dan Campbell seriously. Even Wilbon would have to do that. And I think also all the nice things you said about Jordan Love, it would create a certain skepticism about him if he lost this game at home, right? Right, well, and let's take the flip side of it too, because Jared Goff is somebody whose reputation is also being remodeled right now. He has one of, he's on a streak, Tony, in terms of just touchdowns and interceptions that has been mind blowing. And this is another guy left for dead, right? The Rams didn't want yes. him. The Lions yes. take him. And suddenly he is everything that they need. And so as much as Wilbon, and I feel him through this chair, burning on his bears, they're irrelevant. To me, it's about Jared That's Goff right. and Jordan Love somehow, which I did not expect heading into this season at all. Just one small interruption, because that's how the show was named, and I'll get off. But if Derek Carr does not get hurt with a 17-0 lead last week, mm. then maybe Jordan Love does not rally that team with 18 points in the fourth quarter, right? Maybe it's That's a different right. scenario no. in that situation. Yeah. A real comeback that he has under his belt now because of that, as you pointed out. But I want to move to yeah. last night's developments in baseball. Tony, you love baseball. I want to give you the opportunity here to talk about Ronald Acuna Jr. He is the first 40-70 player ever. I didn't think they made those. But he's still second in the 10th against the Cubs. He would go on to score the winning run against Will Bond's Cubs, knocking the Cubs from the third wild card slot. And then in the American League, the bench is cleared because the Astros beat the Mariners. And Garrett Cole blanked the Blue Jays, and Terry Francona managed his final game in Cleveland. And so, lots of stories here. What is the biggest yeah. one to you? I think the biggest story of last night in baseball is Ronald Acuna Jr. 
because he got the 70th steal, because he was essentially the instrument of winning the game. I think it was the second game in a row where the Braves had come back to beat the Cubs. They knocked them at least temporarily out of the wild card spot. He gets number 70. There's never been a 40-50. There's never been a 40-60. And suddenly no. there's a 40-70 man. And he's going to win the MVP. Right? So I think that's the biggest story. But my inclination is to focus on Terry Francona in what may well have been his last managerial game mm. in, in Cleveland. And that's why the players kept him out on the field so that the fans could adore him, perhaps for the last time. Terry Francona won the first Red Sox World Series in 86 years. And then he won another one. And then he went to <laughs> Cleveland and got that team into the World Series. And Pablo, I think he's going to be in the Hall of Fame. So from a heartstrings circumstance last night, the fact that Terry Francona was celebrated like that warms me. What warmed me personally was the Rays. Because you're talking about the gratification of a career well-earned. I'm talking about delayed gratification. Tony, yeah. I've never seen yeah. this before. The Rays waited 10 days. They had clinched. They, had wa they knew what they were. They waited 10 days to actually pop the champagne and celebrate. Because yeah. I think they had the day off the next day, and it felt like they wanted to maximize the celebration. They were uniquely comfortable in delaying the thing that everybody would do instantaneously. It just is perfect raise to me. They do things differently. They're rationally orchestrated. They di it's like saying, you know what? Honeymoon, not after the wedding. We're going to do it when we have a nice big break at work. It just felt so what I it wonder was about, funny to me. Here's what I wonder about. They scheduled this. They did this beforehand and said, we're going to have it. So did they text each other? How about Wednesday? Does Wednesday look good? Would you rather do Thursday? <laughs> what right. about Friday? So, and so ultimately, it then has the effect of a kid's birthday party. I mean, it's just, it, it, you just <laughs> say, what exactly are you doing? Don't you, you're a Yankee fan. You don't want to talk about Garrett Cole? Really? Tony, Winning the side as, much, last as night? much as I love Garrett Cole leading the AL in whip and opposing batting average innings pitched, I'm a Yankee fan. I can't take a season this depressing and say, oh, at least Garrett Cole got a Cy Young. Come on. Yeah. That's betraying my principles as an egotistical Yankee fan. Please. Yeah. It's a wasted great season. And, a wasted but you know season. What? If Aaron Judge had played 160, they may not be where they are because they did very well That's when right. he played. Let's move he was really from football good. and baseball to basketball, and let's look at the effect of Damian Lillard going to Milwaukee and not Miami. Pablo, where do the other Eastern Conference contenders go from here specifically, Boston, Miami, and Philadelphia? Everybody is in on Drew Holiday, Tony. And the funny part of this story, I was listening to our sweaty friend Dan Lebitard talking about how the Portland Trailblazers basically shut off communications with the Miami Heat. Well, now the Miami Heat are going to try and reopen those same communications to get the door prize of Drew Holiday. Like, Drew Holiday is actually the best perimeter defender in the NBA. He is actually somebody that the Celtics could use, the Heat could use, the Sixers could use. Lord knows I'd love to trade James Harden unilaterally for Drew Holiday, but this is why the trade was made. Suddenly, the Blazers get to do an auction, and they say, you want this guy? Our, our dealing's not over, Tony. Yeah. We're, we've only just begun yeah. this transaction that we saw consummated yesterday. So I agree with that wholly because Portland has drafted guards that they want to play. They're in a total rebuild. And Drew Holiday yep. is just going to get in the way. So they are going to deal him somewhere. My initial reaction when I heard about this yesterday was that I made Milwaukee the favorite to win the NBA championship. And I mm. don't honestly believe that if Lillard had gone to Miami that I would have said exactly the same thing. But now with Antetokounmpo and Lillard and Middleton, that is extremely extremely formidable and it what is. did they give up when they gave up drew holiday they and this surprised me they gave up a guy the same age as lillard so they did not trade young for mm. old they did yep. not and i think that was a very wise trade you look around boston is diminished um they lost marcus smart they lost grant williams they brought in porzingis who never is healthy for a full season no. philadelphia is a standing joke Embiid has <laughs> never been to the conference finals, I don't believe. Maybe I'm wrong no, on that. True. He yaps and no, yaps and yaps. Unfortunately true. He goes yeah. out early and he'll probably now ask to be traded. And Miami, to me, and they overachieve all the time, and I respect them, but I don't think of them as really a title contender at the beginning 
of a season, and they've lost their starting backcourt. So you're 100% right that the game is which of those three teams is going to get Drew Holiday and for what? Right. He's such a good fit. Drew Holiday is one of those players who fits anywhere except Portland because they have Scoot Henderson, yes. they have Simons. Yes. It's just like the one thing. Yeah. And so if you are the Sixers, again, I want to just, you know, I want to sit in the standing joke that is the standing water of the Eastern Conference semifinals, right? That's what it means to be a Sixer fan. We need Drew Holiday. We do. He fits with Tyrese Maxey and Embiid, and it is pathetic that I am pleading with the man through my camera to make my life better, but please, can you demand Philly? Can we try that one, maybe? This is so wonderful that in a short period of time, you're exposed for the Yankee horror this year and the 76ers it's continual a, embarrassment. It's and you say, I affiliate with both. I am a fan. Eh, loser. Let's take a break. Coming up, <laughs> how revolutionary is the Dolphins' offensive scheme? We're going to ask Troy Aikman. We'll also ask him whether Robert Sala should be okay with Aaron Rodgers critiquing the Jets' behavior from afar. You need to change your allegiance. I know. You need to I'm go a process somewhere else. guy. That's why I'm a Sixer guy. I'm a priest of the process. Are you That's also a Denver started. Bronco fan? Are you a At Denver Bronco fan? At this point, Bronco emotionally, fan? it feels like it. It feels like I might yeah. as well be. Let's get back into the NFL with a man who's been calling games with Joe Buck for 22 years, longer than any broadcast booth in NFL history. Monday Night Football game analyst Troy Aikman, an old friend of this show, used to be on all the time. Troy, let's start with this. The Bills host the Dolphins. The Bills coach Sean McDermott called the Dolphins' offensive scheme, quote, revolutionary. Revolutionary. Does it look revolutionary to you? <laughs> it, it did last week <laughs> when, you put up, when you put up 70 points. I mean, that hadn't been done since 66. And they, they're doing a lot of good stuff. Mike McDaniel's done not really nice job. Uh, he was very creative in San Francisco with the run game. Uh, he's doing a lot of good things with the personnel that he has, that he has there. And and Tua is throwing the ball really, really well. He's playing at a high level. And I think probably what's been lost in all of it is how well the offensive line uh, has has played as well. So they've been a fun team to watch. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how they continue to play, but. Last week inflates a lot of numbers, so I'll go with revolutionary. I like that. Troy, let's go to the team that the Dolphins dropped 70 atop, and that would be the Broncos. That would be Sean Payton, who is 0-3. Sean Payton faces the equally winless Bears this weekend. So how big, how necessary is it for Sean Payton to win this game? Well, I, I, hey, I think it's just as necessary for Matt Eberflus. I mean, neither one of these teams mm. or neither one of these coaches are, you know, having a whole lot of fun. Um, and I think that right now when you look at the Broncos and what they went through last year and where Russell Wilson is, uh, you know, he's won like, I don't know, 10 games or so in the, in the last two and a half years, uh, less than two and a half years. So, you know, he hasn't been on the winning side very much. Sean Payton's not used to – you know, being on the losing end as much as he has been already this year. I, I think there's a lot of expectations going back to a year ago. And then when Sean comes in, that, that only, you know, exacerbates it. But uh, there's there's a lot of pressure on the other sidelines as well with the tough start that they've gotten off to and the expectations coming in and the improvement that they expected. So however they feel this week, which is not good, they one of them has yet to hit rock bottom. And they're going to experience that next week. So in terms of how a coach deals with rock bottom, I want to ask you about Robert Sala, the head coach, obviously, of the Jets. He has said that it is OK that Aaron Rodgers is critiquing the Jets from afar. That's what Sala is saying. How does that sound to you? Uh, it sounds like a coach who's hoping that his franchise quarterback comes back and plays whenever he's healthy and able to play. <laughs> uh, you know, so he, he, we saw during hard knocks that that Rodgers is as much a coach as he is as he is a teammate. And, and, and that's to be expected. But I also think that some of what Rodgers has done has been to kind of he's not in the building as he rehabs. And I, and I think part of it is him trying to kind of calm everyone down and, and help out any way that he can. So, you know, I get it. I understand it. Um, and it's just. 
I hate it for everybody in New York with the Jets. I hate it for the league. I hate it for us. We've got Jets games as well on prime time. It's just such high expectations. And now for them to be where they are, it's, uh, it's just unfortunate. All right, Troy, we'll get you out of here on this, and we'll go back to your roots as a player because we're going to ask about the Cowboys. How do you explain that the Cowboys <laughs> look so good for the first two weeks and then look so bad against the Cardinals? Well, it's a, it's a reminder that humility is a week away. And, uh, you know, last week they were ready to hand off the Lombardi Trophy, you know, here in Dallas. And then they went to Arizona. And, and I think urgencies, I think it matters in this league. And Arizona coming off a really disappointing loss the week before and giving up a big lead to the Giants and came out and played. So, uh, you know, Terry Donahue always told me at UCLA, things are never as good as you think they are and they're never as bad as you think they are. And I, and I don't think that's more true than what's happened to Dallas here in the last two games. Troy, it's a great pleasure. It's a great pleasure to have you and to see you like you used to come on the show wearing a T-shirt. This makes me <laughs> yeah. so happy. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You, Troy. <laughs> you can catch more of Troy on Monday Night Football when the Seahawks take on the Giants. Let's take one last break. Still to come, Zach Johnson decides to sit some big-name players to open the Ryder Cup. And the Clippers say Kawhi and Paul George are healthy, but will they stay that way? 22 years, the longest booth. I would not you know, have thought that, Pablo. I would not have. I would have thought I, I would have named other booths. You like it when Troy wears the T-shirt, but not me. I've yeah. noticed that with you. I no, have to wear this. You, he can wear the T-shirt. You need to dress like an adult because you're 18 years old. Troy yeah. is an adult what, and can Super Bowl dress down. Oh for yeah, the show. sure. Super Bowl privilege. And he's wearing sure. his beer hat. He's wearing his beer <laughs> hat. Happy time, people. Happy 32nd birthday, Eddie Rosario. The Braves left fielder has 21 home runs this year. He's one of seven Braves this season to have hit at least 20. Mm. It's a lineup so deep that Rosario batted eighth last night. The Braves are just the third team in history to have hit 300 home runs in a season. They now stand at 303, just four short of the all-time record set by the 2019 Twins with four to play. Rosario was the MVP of the Braves' NLCS win over the Dodgers in 2021, hitting 560. The Braves went on to win the World Series that year, and they will be favored to do it again when the playoffs begin next week. Tony, Eddie Rosario was traded on deadline day 2021 for Pablo Sandoval. Eddie Rosario became the player you just described, an amazing one. Pablo Sandoval, much to the dismay of Pablo's everywhere, did not play since that trade. And the Pablo wow. power rankings shifted henceforth permanently. Wow. So you're number one now. Happy anniversary, Greg A. Harris. On this day, 28 years ago, the ambidextrous Expos reliever became the first pitcher in Major League history to pitch with both arms. Harris faced four batters, starting as a righty, switching to lefty for two batters, then returning to the right side to close out the inning. Harris had more than 700 appearances over 15 seasons, but this was the only time his team allowed him to do this, and he retired after just one more appearance. Harris pitched with a custom glove that was built with an extra thumb so it could be worn on either hand. You know, they made a rule uh, subsequent to all of this that if you're going to pitch ambidextrously, you got to declare which hand you're using to throw. I hate this rule. I think if you can pitch with both hands, you should Do be it. able to use the element of surprise entirely. Like, sorry, it. figure it Absolutely. out. Absolutely. Figure it out. Do it. It just eliminates lefty, righty, righty, lefty. I mean, it, it just changes everything. My left hand, I can't throw five feet. Happy trails to Jordan Spieth, Justin Thomas, Brooks Kepka, and Wyndham Clark playing the opening session of Ryder Cup. The three-day competition tees off at 1.35 in the morning north of Rome. American coach Zach Johnson has decided to sit some very big names for the morning foursomes. Spieth and Thomas have historically comprised one of Team USA's strongest duos with a 4-1 and one record in foursomes. But Thomas has struggled this season, said Johnson, quote, the eight guys I have down on paper are the ones that we feel put us in the best position to get off to a great start, obviously, unquote. But we'll see whether the four will make the pairings for Friday afternoon's four ball session. Tony, this is going to be a shocker to you, but I probably am not going to be, you know, um, at least uh, invested at 1.35 a.m. in the way that you are. Why well, are you going to, are you going to, you're going to do this at 1.35 a.m. You're going to no, pay I'm not attention. Gonna, no, no, but I'm, no, but I'm going to do it by four. 
Here's the thing. Those four guys Oof. who's sitting down, yeah. everyone has won at least one major. Three of them have won multiple majors. I don't know that he knows what he's doing. I don't know, and I expect to see him in the afternoon. I really do. We're running out of show, so we go to the big finish. The Clippers say Kawhi and Paul George are both fully healthy. Are you excited? I am excited. I just don't believe they'll be fully healthy at the end of the season. Inter Miami without right. Lionel Messi lost the final of the U.S. Open Cup. Are you disappointed? I, I don't care if Inter Miami loses the game. <laughs> My disappointment would be that I couldn't see Lionel Messi. No, that he's the draw. The USFL yeah. and the XFL are merging. Do you consider that a big deal? I'm seeing that trademarks are filed for National Spring Football League, Tony. So, uh, kind of, I guess. Um, Travis Hunter and the man who lacerated his liver, Colorado State defensive back Henry Blackburn, they went bowling together. Are you surprised? I I'm not surprised that they reached out to one another. That's a serious injury, and it had a lot of publicity. I'm surprised it's bowling. I am. Last one, <laughs> front office sports reports that your girl Taylor Swift is expected to yeah. attend Sunday night's game between the Chiefs and Jets. That's a big deal, isn't it? It is. You know, it's a democratic question, and I've been outvoted. It is perhaps the biggest deal in the history of sports, according to the coverage that we are collectively giving it. Yeah, big deal. We're out of time. We'll try and do better the next time. Adirondack Tree Service, shout out. Mm, shout out to the Tree Service. I'm Pablo Torre. Thank you for watching. Pablo Torre finds out is the show. Please subscribe. Um, but your sports center. All right, Pablo, which week four storyline are you most looking forward to? Tony, there are some good games. I am a bit of a masochist. I want to talk about the worst. The Broncos okay. are playing the Bears, and I'm sitting here instead of Mike Wilbon, and I want to say the opposite of what he might say. I'm going to love this. I am going to love so much watching two 0-3 teams try to figure out what is the price of human dignity for us. Because Sean Payton came into this talking about how last year it was the worst coaching job he'd ever seen. And what does this yeah. look like now? And meanwhile, I guess just fill in the blanks, Tony, you know about the Bears' misery, but it's almost as bad, which is saying a lot. Here, here's the deal. I find that game, as you do, completely irresistible. And if you like those sort of things, one step down. Now, it's a full step down, but it's only one full step down. You got the Vikings and the Panthers. We're both 0-3. Yeah. They're not sexy losers. They simply stink. So you could do a doubleheader and watch both those Unsexy games. There is losers. one game, one or two games that I am actually interested in. The Dolphins put 70 points on the Broncos last week. The Dolphins are at the Bills. The Dolphins are very fortunate one. to be at the Bills before the bad weather comes. Right? That, that's that's a, a bonus. And everybody who thinks that the Dolphins are unbeatable Consider the last two games that Buffalo has played. The cumulative score is 75 to 13 in favor of Buffalo. <laughs> it, Dolphins are not going to walk in there and win that game easily. The, the other game that interested me was the Ravens, who I thought were a legitimate Super Bowl team. They're at the Browns, who I thought were miles away from being a Super Bowl team. The Ravens lost just the other day, but the Ravens are getting three. Getting through right. Cleveland, that's a line that that's a line that surprised me, it did. Oh, the other line, though, Bills, Dolphins, Bills at home, of course, but they are two-and-a-half-point favorites, Tony. The Bills are favored in this game against the Dolphins, a team that scored 70 they, against those Broncos. Well, they, but and, but yeah. they should be because they're a really good team and they're playing because it they're, home. they're that good, unlike the Chicago Bears. I'm sorry, Wilbon. Um, right. That is it. We're done. Back to you. Killing me, Pop.